Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. I must admit I struggle some on special occasions to find a word for the Lord to specific groups. And Mother's Day is one of those kinds of things for me. In praying about this, Deuteronomy chapter 6 may seem an unusual passage to say something to mothers, but I think it has a tremendous meaning for parents. And I've entitled this, God's Will for Parents. And I'd like for you to turn and follow with me in Deuteronomy chapter 6. For those of you who are theologically minded, you will know that this is the passage of Scripture that means so much to to, uh, the Jewish mind and heart. It's called the Shema. It is the central theological affirmation of the Old Testament faith that God is one Lord. And I have uh, dealt with this passage in a theological context of monotheism before. But today I would like to look at this passage from the perspective of God's will for parents. I'd like to start this sermon by asking you three penetrating questions. If you are not a parent, I would like to ask you these questions in the context of your closest friends. Number one, what are you passing on to your children or to your close friends? What are you passing on? Number two. What will your children remember about you? What will they remember about you? Number three, if all your children knew about God, they learned from you, would they be Christians? If all your children knew about God, they learned from you, would they be Christians? Now, those questions can be answered with a flippant, of course. But I want you to know the Bible records some great spiritual men and women who were tremendous, tremendous followers of God but were not able to communicate that faith to their children. Do you remember the story of Eli in 1 Samuel 2, 12 through 17? Samuel had a great heart for the Lord. He was the high priest. His sons were to follow in his footsteps. But his sons were evil men that knew not the Lord. And the Lord raised up Samson, I mean, excuse me, Samuel. And Samuel became a man totally dedicated to the Lord. But when it came time for him to die and to pass his position of leadership on to his children, lo and behold, the same thing that had happened to Eli happened to Samuel, and Samuel's children were not worthy to be followers in their father's footsteps, and they were rejected. And that's where Israel first wanted a king. I think of a man that is so highly praised in the Bible as David. David is called a man after God's own heart. But David, as a parent, was a miserable, utter failure.
What are you passing on to your kids? What are they going to remember? What do they know about God from you? I would like to look at these nine verses in the context of those questions. First, I'd like to say that it is God's will for parents to pass on their personal faith. Let me say, let me say it again. It is God's will that parents pass on to their children their personal faith. I think one of the tragedies of the modern church organization that connects itself to Sunday school is the fact that the majority of parents have let Sunday school be the spiritual educators of their children. Sunday school was never meant to take the place of parental training in the home. Never meant. But our society has become a society either where the parents drop their kids off at church or they send them to Sunday school to learn about God. It has been and remains God's will that parents impart to their children their personal faith in God through Christ. Let me give you just a few scripture references in the book of Deuteronomy to back up what I'm saying. Deuteronomy 4, 9. This passage in Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Deuteronomy 6, 20 through 25. Deuteronomy 11, 19. Encourages, implores, commands parents. To teach their children the things of God. Now, either the Bible is inspired or it's not. It is not an option for parents to teach their children. It is a command of God for parents to teach their children. No one else can communicate to your little ones what you can communicate to your little ones. And it is nobody else's spiritual responsibility as much as it is your spiritual responsibility before God. Now, I want to say something else about that. I'm not simply talking about moral lecturing. I'm not talking about telling them right from wrong. Though that is important. But dear friends, I think you know deep down in your heart that children do not pick up on words. They pick up on actions. They pick up on attitudes. Your children will not listen to your words unless your actions and your lifestyle and your priority are saying the same things as your words. If your lifestyle and your words are congruous, children will hear. But the the fact of the matter is, we speak a lot better faith than we live. And I want you to know that your children will be like you in priorities and goals and ultimates. And whatever you say will not change How you live. It's kind of like parents who are alcoholics talking to their children about the problem of drug abuse. Now, does that seem incongruent to you? Well, it does to kids, too. Your kids will pick up on how you live, not what you say. And the lifestyle is presented in verse 7 of Deuteronomy 6, where it says, And you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, 
When you lie down and when you rise up. What's that saying? That is saying that children will hear about your personal faith in God and see it acted out in your life when you get up in the morning as you walk through the day and when you lay down to sleep at night. It will not be a one day a week thing. What a tragedy when we've made one day a week religious and live the rest secularly. All of life belongs to God and parental responsibility is a seven day a week, 24 hour a day lifestyle walk of faith. Your children will pick up on God by seeing you live in the constant sense of His presence from morning till evening and all through the day. We impart to our children our lifestyle. Second in that, I want to say and emphasize that it is an ongoing teaching. Now, I have learned as much from my Christian parents as a young adult with young children as I did as a young child. You know, there's a tendency in the church to say, I've done my part now. It's up to you. But I want you to look at verse 2 where it mentions about this communication of the faith of the Christian when it says, all the days of your life, You know, I think we really grow tired in keeping on, keeping on. In the back of our mind, we kind of say, well, I've done it so long, surely I get a a, a little reprieve from this responsibility and pressure. No. We communicate to our children and to those we love and to those that are around us every day of our life. And there's no time off. We are constantly communicating. In verses 7 through 9, it speaks about keeping our faith constantly before our children again. I read verse 7. Let me include 8 and 9. And you shall bind them. Bind what? The statutes, the commandments, the teachings of God. We would say the, the teachings of the Bible. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on the gates. Now, the Jews took this very literally. And you've probably seen the mezuzah, the little box containing Scripture that is nailed on the doorpost of Jewish homes. And maybe you've seen on television the rabbis who wear the little phylactery, the little black box on their forehead. And maybe you've seen on ceremonial occasions as a Jew would wrap seven times in a leather throng the law on his hand. Now, I think this is much more symbolic than that. I don't think God wants a little box on our forehead as much as He wants His commandments in our lives. He does not want us to wrap our bodies in Scripture text or tattoo them On our arms, He wants them to be in our minds that are worked out in our hands. The Bible is quite specific when it says what we think about, what we meditate on, what we put into our minds is what works out of our tongue, our hands, and our feet. And this is saying keep before you in every area of your life the things of God. Keep them on your mind. Keep them on your hand. Keep them on your heart. Keep God's will ever before you in every action of life is what this is talking about. If you do that, you will communicate to your children. But children pick up hypocrisy and incongruency quicker than anybody. Now, The second thing, major thing I want to say is, what is the content of the faith that we are to pass on? I think you and I all have, at least when I hear a a story about how the 
Harakrishnas are brainwashing their children. There is a real tug at my heart on, oh God, how many young people are being filled and, and continually filled with the false teachings of cults. Sometimes they do a better job than we do. What are we to impart? What is the nature of the message and the lifestyle we do impart? I think this text says it. In verse 4, it has the centrality and the uniqueness of the one Creator, Redeemer, God. Friends, our children are hearing a bunch of garbage in public and secondary institutions of education. Pure garbage as to the origin, purpose, nature, background, functioning of a world system. If the Bible is true, then we have a brand new orientation about life and its purpose and its meaning. It is important that we pass on to our kids that there is an ultimate creator, redeemer, ethical God that created this universe and we ourselves to be in communion with Him. It is central in what we communicate. A personal, loving, Creator, Redeemer God. Notice in this text, especially in, uh, let's see, verse 5, probably is the best one, where it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. What are we to communicate to our kids? Commitment. A walk of faith. A walk of love. You see, all too often, parents communicate a segmented lifestyle. We do one thing at church, we do one thing at school, we do one thing on the job, we do one thing in recreation, and we do something else then on certain days of the week. And the truth of the matter is that if Christianity is true, it demands our allegiance seven days a week in whatever context we find ourselves. We are to be 100% Sold out to God in Christ. There is to be no spiritual compromise no matter what situation we find ourselves in. We are to love God with all of our soul, mind, strength, body, personality, resources. He is to be priority in every area of expenditures priorities, goals, dreams, plans. We teach our kids more how to live in a push, push, push world than we do in the presence of a loving God. We train them more how to live in a society dominated by success than we do in a society supposedly dominated by submission. We are to communicate a priority commitment to the one God. And as verse 20 through 25 shows us in the same context, we are to communicate to our kids the great acts of God in the past. For the Jew, it was the exodus that was so important. And later on, the exile, the return from the exile and the return from the exodus that just consumed the Jewish mind about who God was. And the reason that the exodus was so important to the Jew is that it was on God's grace initially. It wasn't based on God's law. The law didn't come until after God had already delivered them. It was that message of grace that was the central pillar that the Jews wanted to impart to their kids whenever they could. God loved us and brought us out. Now, I think it's so, so important that we communicate to our children the great acts of God, not only in the Bible, but the great acts of God in our own lives. I can remember as such a young child, my mother talking to me about meaningful times that she has spent with the Lord. 
One sticks in my mind, and I can't remember how young I was when she told me this, but it so stuck with me that through the years I have remembered it. My parents were divorced quite early. I was three years old when my daddy left. And my mother told me she, that she was so young and confused and discouraged and disheartened. She said, Bob, I just told the Lord just to take my life. And Bob, it was just you and me and there was no one to take care of you. And so I asked God to take your life and my life. And she said, when I was thinking about doing that, she said, I felt a hand on my shoulder. And a voice in my ear that says, it'll be all right. Hey, hey, I remember that. Because I remember, my mother said, Bob, the Lord told me that you would be a preacher right then. Man, when the dark days come and I don't understand... I remember my mother saying, Bob, the Lord told me, hey, we need to communicate those meaningful times with God with our kids. Thirdly, what is the appropriate response that we're looking for from our children? If you think your children are going to walk in your priorities all their lives, you're mistaken. They're not. What kind of response do we want from our children? What do we demand of them? This text tells us what the appropriate response is. And it's two things. The first one is obedience. The hardest thing we do in the Christian faith is do what we know we ought to do. Simple as that. Jesus put it so well to the people of his day who were following him saying, Oh, Lord, Lord. And he turned on them and said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I tell you to do? Luke 6, 46. That's a pretty good question. How can we claim to know God in a personal way and not do the things that he's told us to do? The first appropriate response is obedience to what we know of God's will for our life. Now, you're not responsible for what you do not know. You're not responsible for that. But friends, all of us know more than we're doing. So the first thing is obedience. The second thing is attitude. I know a lot of people who keep, uh, keep rules, but with the wrong attitude. Attitude is as crucial as obedience. And the attitude is here. It's first in verse 2 and then in verse 5 in what seems to us to be a paradox of words. In verse 2, it says that we might fear the Lord. Now, the word there is a word that means respect. Be it in awe of who He is. I I have goosebumps when I hear God called the great dodger in the sky. I feel like digging a hole because I know the lightning's coming. You know, call him granddad or the the man upstairs. I get goosebumps of fear from us referring to the Creator, Redeemer God in terms like that. We need to have an awesome respect that when all is said and done, we are but dust and our righteousness is as filthy rags Compared to Him, there ought to be a respect for God. Now, I realize Jesus Christ is our elder brother, and I realize we're bid to come to Him. But friends, there should be an awedness about God in our lives. But with this fear is matched, and this awedness and this respect... With this is matched love, a respect, an awe, love. They, see, they almost seem to be, to be unmatchable, and yet that's exactly the paradox that we find ourselves in. He is holy. He is transcendent. He is creator. The same minute 
the same minute, he is daddy. And he bids us come. Whew. Love, fear are the attitudes that mark the boundaries of the attitude that our children should have. And finally, what are the, from this text, what are the responses that God will give us if we impart these kinds of things to our kids? What, what are the blessings that God will pour out if our children reflect the things we've talked about? Well, the first one, it may be surprising to you, the first one is in uh, verse 2, where it mentions the last little phrase, that your days may be prolonged. This is the same, same little uh, phrase that occurs in the deal about honoring father and mother in the Ten Commandments. And, and it says if we honor them or give due weight to them, uh, that our days will be prolonged. It's been interpreted saying if you are respect your parents and love them, that you'll live a long life. It's not what it's talking about. It is not an individual promise of longevity. But it is a corporate promise of a stable society. The great blessing of God was that His people were in the land that He gave them, living in abundance over a long period of time. God wants to bless us. You know, it took me a long time to realize that because for years of my life, I pictured God as the black robe judge with the sledgehammer. And it really took God some melting and moving for me to see Him not as the judge, but as the loving Father who wanted the best for my life. But because I lived with so many other of His children, He had to put bounds on my freedom that all of us could live together in joy and abundance. That's what God promises for a society that passes on a love and priority commitment to God is a society that's stable through time. Next, He promises that He will fulfill all the promises that He's made to us. And you see that in verse 3. For these particular people, he says, I will greatly multiply you and I will give you the land that I promised to your fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. I believe it's God's will to give us the good things of life. I believe it's God's will that we'd be happy and have what we need. I don't believe poverty and disease was in the original will of God. Now, we're caught up in a world that's fallen, and we're reaping the consequences of that fallenness. But I think ultimately God's will for our life is abundance, prosperity, joy, happiness, social compatibility, and all the rest. Those will be, to some extent, the blessings for a society that passes on to their kids a reverent love for God. I would like to conclude with these few words. Number one, parents, mothers, you cannot trust others to teach your children about God. Number two, you are the most influential person in your child's life. I know their peers come teenage years are awful significant, but over time, you are the most significant person in the life of your family. Number three, your actions and your priorities speak a whole lot louder than your words. Number four, you are a steward before God of your children. They do not belong to you. You have been given a stewardship. You will give an account of who and what they are as far as it depends on you. Proverbs 22.6, Proverbs 23.13 are words of wisdom to parents about their kids. You ought to read those later. Proverbs 6.22, excuse me, Proverbs 22.6 and Proverbs 23.13.
Parents, do not grow weary in well-doing. It will be worth it in the end. I don't think most of you can imagine how far away from the Lord your pastor was at one time. It is impossible in a mixed group for me to communicate to you how far from the Lord as a Christian young person I had strayed. And it is my firm conviction and belief that one of the things that brought me back to God was a mother that continued to pray through it all for her son. Hang in their parents. Hold them up to the Lord. Do the best you can and then leave it with God. He'll do the rest. But you are responsible. At the same time, you have to let them go. It's a paradox, but it's true. I would like for you quietly to bow your head. Every head bowed, every eye closed. For this one final request, I want to ask everybody right now, if your parents are still alive, and in particular your mother, to call their name out before God right now. If they somehow hurt you, I want you to t just ask God to give you a sweeter spirit about them. If they were a blessing to your life, I want you to thank God for who they are right now. Secondly, if you're here and you're the parent of a child, I don't care if they're 60 years old or 6 months old, if you're a parent of a child or a grandparent of a child, I want you to call their name before God right now. I want you to call their name before God for God's will for that life, for God's protection, for God's leadership, and for God's will to be manifest in that life. Call their name right now before God. Right now. Lord, we're never able to pay back the debt we owe for those who have gone before us. Those who cared enough and took enough time to stop when we were little, Lord, and impart to us the great truths of the Bible. God, help us to be faithful in our day, to impart to the little ones around us those same meaningful eternal truths that have so directed and guided our paths. Oh, Lord... I thank you for parents, not just parents, God, but godly, spiritual, mature parents that live what they speak. Oh, God, thank you for them in the church and in the home. And Lord, I pray for little ones who do not have this blessing that in your grace you would let some of us who sense the responsibility Impart those spiritual truths to the little ones around us who have no one at home to impart those truths to. God, thank you for a godly mother and for people who cared about a young child, one among so many. God, I thank you for them and you know the names that I'm holding up to you. And I pray you'd give us that sense of responsibility toward the young and gratitude toward the old. In Jesus' name, amen.